Yeah, I used to say, hey, try to save your money and, and put as much down as you can to make your payment easier. But you know what? Sometimes that doesn't make sense because what if you, you're saving your money and the property values just keep going? You're not seeing that equity. So it would have been better to purchase with, say, 10% down or 5% down instead of trying to wait for that 20%. How's it going, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of the Sean and Matt Show. My name is Matt. That is Sean. Welcome to our show. Sean, how's it going today? Good, man. October 22nd. Today is my brother's 50th birthday. 50th. The 50th. big 5 zero. Can you believe that, man? I'm getting old. Starting to get old. Luckily, he's older than me, so we won't say by how many years. And then tomorrow's my anniversary. Tomorrow's your anniversary. How many years anniversary? <laughs> Putting you on the spot. Uh, eight years married, 16 years dating and married. So that, that shows you how long it took me to, uh, to tie the knot. But, um, yeah, so we're having a big party this weekend. We have the family coming in to see the new house. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we're going to be, of course, safe. But, uh, got to get together, man. Got to see the family. Definitely. And, um, so you just put on a new listing. It's got an amazing yeah. view. And, you know, I was working with a buyer a couple of years ago and they were like, well, the human psychology of the brain is if your brain gets used to something, you no longer see that thing. You no longer see that it's valuable. And that was someone that's never had a nice view. Yeah. Because that view of the Washington Monument, you're not going to get tired of seeing you're that. You're never going to get tired of that. It's gorgeous. Uh, we did a video. Check out the video on YouTube. Uh, straight from that 14th floor balcony, watching the sunrise over the monuments. It's pretty awesome. Cool. I wouldn't get sick of it. Well, in today's video, Sean, we're going to be talking about first-time homebuyer confessions. Mm -hmm. We're going to be talking about Gen Z and the future of the retail brick-and-mortar brokerage office. Let's start with first-time homebuyer confessions, and Realtor.com has an article out where they essentially interview um, a set of first-time homebuyers that recently bought their first property. Confessions mm -hmm. of a first-time homebuyer, how we All beat right. out... 32 other offers and uh, you know also often we're always talking with other real estate agents about how to work with clients how to best utilize our services and it's it's really rare to get that like genuine peel back the curtain not you know the review exactly where everything is rainbows and unicorns but actual surprises so um, this is a couple it looks like they had moved from New York City to Boston, they were looking to buy a single family house in the 600s. Um, and it goes through their process. So first of all, down payment. Um, this first time home buyer, they actually put down 20%. With your first time home buyers, are they mostly putting down 20% or are they putting down less? What, what do you see? Oh, uh, it really depends. I mean, I've seen them five, 10, 15, 20. It doesn't, doesn't really matter. And yeah, I used to say, hey, try to save your money and, and put as much down as you can to make your payment easier. But you know what? Sometimes that doesn't make sense because what if you, you're saving your money and the property values just keep going? You're not seeing that equity. So it would have been better to purchase with, say, 10% down or 5% down instead of trying to wait for that 20%. Or look at interest rates as well. You know, the time it's taking you to save this money, you could have scored on it right now. The rates are like in the twos, but they're going up. So when does it make, ch I mean, right now is the best time. Don't wait for 20%, buy it 5, 10, whatever you can afford, in my opinion. Yeah, um, <clears throat> and these buyers, it looks like they were a little bit older for first-time home buyers. They're still young. It looks like they have two kids. They're probably in their early 30s or late 20s, and it says they had been saving for about three years. You know, I have a couple buyers that are putting down less than 20%, like, as we speak. So definitely not a prerequisite. But in terms of homes, how many homes did they see in person? They saw about 10 homes. Do you think this is a low number, a high number, or kind of right in the middle of For me, that? it's probably a little low, yeah. to be honest. I mean, I show 15, 20 at least to a lot of these people. You'll always have that one buyer, two buyers that sees one, and they're like, I love this place. But if but you're showing someone 20 houses, I like, have they not narrowed them down online, or are you seeing them and they're not winning the offer? Why, why are well, you showing Well, sometimes we'll see a bunch in one day to try to get them done, so I've, I've done that before. 
Um, it also depends on the market too. So if there are a ton on the market and you can see a bunch, then that's one thing. But what if it's a tight market? You keep seeing this and then you lose an offer. So you'll probably get into this, but you know, if you keep losing, then you got to keep seeing and you'll see three at a time and then three at a time and you know, five at a time, whatever it is. So sometimes these things add up. I would say on average, you're probably showing in the low teens, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and it says that they put in offers on five different houses. There you go. And um, they saw 10, batting 500. You know, if it was baseball, you'd be in the Hall of Fame. But if you're a first time home buyer, that's got to be frustrating. You that's know? crazy because, you know, seeing 10 and writing on five. Yeah. I mean, me personally, I saw like 100 and I wrote on one. Like, yeah. Like, I'm too yeah. picky. These, some this people are very not, not picky. Normal. So, yeah, like, no, this is putting, not normal. Like, so, first of all, these people strike me as very analytical. So if you're only going out and seeing 10 houses, that's one thing. But if you're putting five offers down on the 10 that you've seen, that tells me that you specifically know what you want and you're going after it. So, that's I mean, good. And that there's inventory. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, that's the thing is lack of inventory hurts. And so a lot of times, you know, I have buyers out there right now and we just can't find the right thing. It's not popping up. Or, you know, but... Certain other instances right now, the condo market, you can see whatever you want. So, so it says, um, why didn't the first couple offers pan out? And they, the buyers do mention HGTV. They wanted that HGTV buying experience, walk in, you know, see the three properties right on one of them. But it also says that they were surprised um, by the amount of competition. Something we glossed over was they beat out 32 offers. That's and this ridiculous. is in Boston, even in Arlington. It's rare, obviously, to have 32 offers. They went 50000 above list price, which in Arlington, you'd probably go a little bit higher at the $600,000 price range if, you're, if you have 32 offers. Yeah, and the thing is, uh, I'll give you a story about my personal uh, search for homes. I wrote on one, I wrote the best offer that I've ever written. Uh, the house is probably slightly underpriced. Taylor? There were 1,700, I, I X'd that street out of my mind, I don't remember, um, but 17 offers. I didn't realize there were 17 offers. I went $150,000 above asking wow. price, zero contingencies, I came in fourth. Wow. So that's the level of competition for, in, uh, for Arlington single family homes at that time. So how did these people beat out the 32 other offers? They said, um, you know, they waived pretty much every contingency. They weren't the highest offer they did write a love letter to the seller so sometimes it works um, i haven't read their love letter but it has to do with hey our two daughters my husband we moved here we know this is the neighborhood for us yada 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 if you can pull on those emotional heartstrings um it's probably sometimes, not gonna hurt it, it, it won't hurt uh sometimes it really works to be honest so uh, one of the biggest surprises for them is um how quickly the home process started, but then after you put in and had the offer accepted, everything slowed down. So they said that they would see a house, decide in the first couple minutes, because when you walk into a property, you usually get that gut feeling within the first 10 to 15 seconds where either yes, I could see myself here, or no, this is not the right place for me. So they said all of that was like, okay, all right, yeah, this is the one we want to write on, let's do it, let's go over asking, let's write the letter. But then once it got accepted, well, now you have 30 days until closing. So now everything moves a little bit slower to get the paperwork um, in hand and processed. Yeah, and people are surprised by, you know, I as well, sometimes you feel like, man, when's this thing closing? You know, it feels like it was a long time ago, but it's the loan process. It's going to take at least 20 days for that loan process to happen. Most lenders out there are asking for 30 days to close it. You've got to do your appraisals. You've got to do all your inspections, all that stuff. So there's always something happening. But once you get over that little hump, then you've got like 15, 20, three weeks maybe of pretty much nothing until you close. The biggest takeaway before we'll move on is what is your advice for aspiring home buyers? Number one, when you find the house you like, you have to jump on it as soon as possible. Something that Sean and I harp on a lot. And number two, some markets are aggressive right now. And if you're not ready for that, then it's going to take you a long time to find the right house. That's the problem. It's a learning experience for a lot of these buyers. And we can tell them everything that we want them to do. But a lot of times they don't feel comfortable doing that for the first one, two, three losses. And then they're like, 
okay, I get what you're saying now, and I'm pissed, and I'm going to go after this thing. And then finally, the fourth one, they get it, right? So, uh, you know, if you could take our advice at the very beginning, you might win, but it takes buyers a few times to get there. So the next article is about Gen Z. Um, Gen Z are starting to buy houses. This is the generation after millennials. Millennials were once known as Gen Y, but then it just became millennials. So millennials are like 1984 to um, like 1996 roughly, and Gen Z, uh, 1996, 1995, to 2010. So if you're born in 2010, obviously 10 year olds aren't buying houses. But if you were born in 1996, that quick math would make you 24. Mm -hmm. 24 year olds buy houses. Yeah. 20 year olds buy houses. In fact, 18 year olds buy houses. So Gen Z is well underway in their home buying process. And mm -hmm. Realtor.com has an article about the top 10 cities where Generation Z is purchasing properties. Now, these housing markets, they need the right combination of, you know, n not a low sales price, but cer say, yeah. certainly not a high sales price. I mean, they're not, you know, this isn't like $100,000, you know, ranch homes or, or mobile homes. Like, you have an educated um, population. You have to have, you know, good credit scores, good job history. So, you know, this isn't San Francisco. This isn't LA. This isn't Manhattan. These are top 10 cities for Gen Z and it has to be a younger um, buyer pool like a younger city so hmm. you know you're not gonna have these huge metropolis areas so some of the cities on the list number 10 Buffalo number 9 st. Louis Louisville Phoenix Arizona okay. Kansas City and Minneapolis start the top I was gonna five. guess Minneapolis you're gonna was, guess that Minneapolis. Was the one thing that came to my head I'm like alright where's kinda like yeah so sales prices for these are, you know, between uh, two twenty nine for Buffalo. Uh, I got uh, Big Z's moving to Buffalo. I think is he? I think he's moving to um, mm -hmm. Buffalo. A, a, a realtor friend of ours. You know, he's living in the D.C. area, and you know, oh, you right. see the properties in Buffalo that you can get for the money in D.C. and it's depressing. Mm -hmm. Maybe not as depressing as Buffalo winters, <laughs> but um, you can get a lot for your money. In Buffalo, big fan of uh, of Western and upstate New York. Um, yeah. Number four, Cincinnati. I have a cousin that lives in Cincinnati. Number three, Indianapolis. Number two, Oklahoma City. Hmm. And number one, Salt Lake City, wow. Utah. What are your thoughts on that list? Salt Lake City. Well, I mean, now that it's logical, I guess you have to find the smaller cities that are affordable. And that's what I was going through in my head. I'm like. All right, somewhere in Ohio, maybe somewhere out Midwest, they're going to be a little more affordable. Where are the hip spots? You know, I was thinking Austin, but that's too expensive. Yeah. You know, I started thinking Philadelphia, but that's probably still too expensive. Maybe Philly could be, you know, one of those. Yeah. yeah. None of these cities are in California. Yeah. None of them are in Florida. There's not too many in the Northeast. Uh, most of them are in um, the Midwest, Midwest. and. Uh, not even the West Coast, but mostly the, the Midwest. And, you know, Salt Lake City, they have that younger, um, you know, Mormon demographic. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that, but it says it in the article. And, you know, uh, generally speaking, people that follow that faith are educated, um, smart. They have, uh, you know, some money lying around. And, and it's, you know, job availability for these young kids, you know. Yeah, so. they're, yeah they're, you know, good... Yeah. yeah, good background, whatever. Yeah. In real sense, you never want to comment yeah. on religion, but like if you're complimenting someone, like yeah. they're clearly doing something right if they're buying houses um, when they're 24 years old. So those are the most popular yeah. metros for um, Gen Z because I think in the next couple of years, you're going to see a lot of um, shifting areas with people moving out of California, people moving to Texas, people moving to Florida, moving to Las Vegas. Las Vegas wasn't on here, I guess... Um, the Gen Zs are not not big gamblers. There's not much there, you know, and the property yeah. values have dropped big time in Las Vegas. Yeah. So I don't know what they're at now compared yeah. to the peak, but I think a lot of people from California are moving to yeah. Las Vegas. Um, Oklahoma City. I'm trying to think about what city I would want to live in out of these uh, this list. So I've only so I've been to Buffalo. I've been to St. Louis. St. Louis is a cool little city. Um, 
I yeah. Have, I've I flew into Salt Lake. I've never really been there. Cincinnati, I, I've been to. Um, yeah, which one would you choose? I, I might know. go to Phoenix. Yeah, Phoenix yeah. would be cool. I think uh, Phoenix. I, I'd like to I'd like to hang out in Salt Lake City. You ever been to Utah? You ever been to Zion National? I, no, Park? I'd love to go, man. That yeah. would be sweet. Okay, so the third topic that we're going to talk about is the brick and mortar realtor brokerage offices because before the pandemic you know not many realtors would go into the office not many realtors would hang out at the office and get work done usually it's like kind of water cooler atmosphere where that's where you go to kind of not work and just talk and, and BS with other realtors. Correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. That's what happens. You go to the office and you never get anything done because right. you're talking the whole time. And yeah. now, you know, during the pandemic, of course, no one went um, to a realtor brokerage office. And now after the pandemic where brick and mortar is, it's so, um, you, you know, it's, it's harder to get people through the front door. Um, how is the brick and mortar realtor uh, brokerage office going to transform over the next couple of years, you know, I've, I, I follow a certain markets and I follow the Seattle market and there is a Realogix Sotheby's International office that opened up in the Bellevue neighborhood. Sean, I'm not sure if you can see this picture. It's pretty small, but mm -hmm. they opened up an office and in the office, there's a coffee shop. There's an outdoor like seating area. It's right on the main strip. And, you know, the brokerage office, it should be a place to hang out. It should be a place to have neighborhood events. It should be kind of a hub of the neighborhood where, oh yeah, by the way, we sell real estate as opposed to like an insurance office or like a doctor's office where the sole purpose is to just go there to conduct real estate transactions because, you know, trainings are taking place uh, virtually. Any sort of meetings are taking place virtually. So when everything opens back up, why would the consumer go to a brokerage office if they're not going to buy real estate? That's interesting. I didn't um, see it that way, but that's a very cool concept to, you know, make it a hybrid kind of office. You know, you have a little coffee shop in there, a place to hang out like you were doing yesterday. You were working outside, have a little outdoor space. You know, the cubicle thing is gone. And I used to walk into real estate offices before and there'd be cubicles. I'm like, this Thanks, man. I would never work in that atmosphere. Our office here in Arlington is actually a very cool office. Um, there are some offices that, you know, smaller glass cube all offices you can go into. Uh, but we have an open space where we can entertain, you know, get a keg, have fun, right? But will that kind of office stick around? Um, so what do you think? It sounds you think? like you, you disagree with me on, on one of the things here. So, yeah. So... I don't think that brick and mortar offices are going to go away. Um, I think that they're still going to be there because there's there's always going to be that 80-20 kind of thing, right? 20% of those people or offices might go completely virtual, but there's always going to be that 80% now that, that when they're working from home, they're not quite getting as much done as they wanted to. And I'll give you me as an example. I was never an office goer, but the opposite happened to me because my daughter was going to school and I was crammed in a, you know, a two bedroom condo for a while. And so I had to get out of there to get anything done. And I was actually going to the office and getting a bunch done. So there is that kind of opposite effect with the kids staying home, doing school there. Where are you gonna work if you don't have the space? Some people will come in. Um, but yeah. given the choice, if you had a, a better work from home environment, you'd, you'd probably stay home. Right, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that I would, you know, I'm changing in my, my age, I think. I was always the guy that was like, I'm never going into the office. I don't need the office, blah, blah, blah. But now I'm like, you know what? I want to get things done. I want to... When you're at home, there's always an excuse to do something else. There's always an excuse to stop, right? And that's what my fear is, is like, if it goes completely that way, I don't think... I think people will get complacent in their work activity and they, in, in turn, won't get as much done. But if you always have, and you know, if you go into that office and you're staying there, you're going to stay there. And then, you know, when you have somebody on your team there as well, and we're like, hey, let's brainstorm and stuff, and you and I would probably get a lot more done in that, in that regard. So I think it's going to stay. And one, one example I was thinking about on the way here, because we actually came up with these topics yesterday. Yeah. Usually we come up with them right in front. Doing some homework. Yeah, doing some homework. So I was driving here, and I'm thinking, all right, well, think about other industries. Think about, like, the fitness industry. 
that's probably hurting big time right now because a lot of people don't want to go into those uh, the gyms, the big gyms. But truthfully, there's a lot of big gyms in Arlington right now, and they're still being they're still paying the bills, and there's still people that want to go into these offices. You've got so many different options now with the Pelotons, the Mirror. You can work at home, work out at home. But I think most people want that opportunity. They'll probably buy a Peloton. They'll probably have, but they'll probably also still have a gym membership, right? So they're still going to kind of do both. And I think that's the way real estate is and probably for the most part will be is like, hey, let's um, let's work from home or let's go into the office. Now, maybe and as I'm thinking of this and as I'm saying it, I'm thinking, oh, well, there's other options too. If you do go that hybrid route, you could always just go to Starbucks or go to like some other place where you can work like you did yesterday. Matt uh, sent out a picture on Instagram yesterday of himself. I'll put it up. Yeah, of himself working in this killer outdoor space in Roslyn. Tell us about it. Yeah, Roslyn 02. Turn the 02 into the 03. So basically Roslyn Bid um, has uh, some park area that they're allowed to hold event space in and they um, they constructed an outdoor office that has blazing fast Wi-Fi, it has restrooms, it has portable chargers, and it has different workstations. It has standing desks, sitting desks, meeting areas. Um, so really cool atmosphere to uh, to work outside, to get outside the office. And you know, I was I was thinking about it, Sean, you know, earlier I said, you know, how can we get consumers through the front door of a broker office if they're not buying real estate? And while it's true that you're not going to go to your barber shop if you don't need a haircut, you're not going to go to your auto body shop if you don't need to get your brakes checked. But I think brokerage offices are unique in a sense that they're a part of the community where you can hold events, you can do things for the community, you can get a gathering of people there and not necessarily have it focus on real estate. So it's almost a hybrid mm -hmm. of a bunch of different things that you're able to do. And if you're on like the seventh story of an office building, I don't think you're going to be able to do that, you know, right. kind of more of a, a stuffy feeling. But if you're on the, the street level, what I really wish our office had is like those, just copy and pasting, like those garage kind of doors that yeah. open up and people can just flow in and out. So it's a very I, cool idea. Yeah. yeah. And I, I really agree with the fact that having a ground floor office where you can walk right in off the sidewalk is key. Uh, I'm not a big fan of the ones that you got to go in an elevator upstairs and you're just kind of secluded up there. Um, so I think this is a really cool concept. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a better way of pulling in the community. And um, yeah, good idea. And I, you know, when I joined Century 21 Redwood in 2014, I noticed that the top agents, except for Sean, um, never came into the office. They never, I never saw them at meetings. I never saw them, you know, hanging out. I never saw them. And, and maybe that's because they were too busy doing business. I get that point. But how can we create brokerage offices where top agents actually want to go into the office, whether that is to work, to conduct meetings with their team, or to hold events? So it's going to be really interesting to see how the not only retail landscape as a whole changes, but how the brokerage model uh, for brick and mortar stores changes in the future. Yeah, it's very interesting, and it could go either way. I, I could see it. I could see it coming back after this whole mess kind of clears up for us. But I love the concept of the community, you know, pull people in off the sidewalk. Hey, here's a little cafe kind of thing in our office. Yeah. Or like a hybrid. Yeah, it's neat. Yeah, it should almost be like the neighborhood barber shop where everyone just like stops hey, by let's and go says hang hello. Out and, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's cool. Um, cool, guys. Well, there you have it. Another episode of the Sean and Matt show in the books. We're just flying through. I, I got to see what number episode we're, we're on. Not a lot. We're not a big, hey, this is episode 100, let's celebrate. We're a big Thursday, 1 p.m., let's crank out another and get after it. We've done a lot. I mean, We've it's done been a lot. a lot. We'll look. We'll look. There you have it, guys. Well, until next time, for Sean and myself, we'll see you then. Take care.